Welcome back to Retro Axis. If you're new to this show, we do a lot of live experimenting. And what I'm going to do in this particular episode is actually experiment with the Atari VCS system. This is a relatively new system that has just reached some of the hands of the Indiegogo backers uh, just, to, just in the last week. And so uh, what I want to do in this episode is look at the alternative operating systems or the OS mode feature. And what I'm going to do first is before I actually try and install an operating system, I want to look under the covers on the hard drive of the Atari VCS and see exactly what's on this thing. Um, I know I earlier tried to boot OpenSUSE. This is a copy of SUSE Linux. Uh, and as I started with the installation, uh, what, what I noticed was it wanted to wipe out the entire partition table and create something new, which made me think, well, if I do that, I'll probably lose the Atari VCS operating system. So what I'm going to do is take uh, a deeper look, understand the actual partition layout, and go through, this, go through a couple experiments, perhaps trying to even install SUSE on an external USB uh, SSD drive, which is this device here. So we'll do, be doing a few things live. You'll be watching me as I do this. None of this has been pre-scripted or done before. Um, I'll be learning and you'll be watching me <laughs> muddle my way through this. So uh, stay tuned if you're interested and uh, let's get started. So firstly, this is the setup that I have uh, so you can see exactly what I'm doing, what I'm working with. Um, so I've got my Atari VCS console. This is the Onyx 800 edition. Uh, it is plugged in uh, with an Ethernet cable and HDMI going into this uh, monitor. This is a 24 inch monitor capable of 1920 by 1200. Uh, it also uh, has a USB uh, cable here going back into the joystick controller. So I've got that hardwired in rather than Bluetooth. Uh, I've also got a USB keyboard and, uh, and mouse, which is wireless, and the wireless receiver is plugged into the rear uh, USB 3.0 port here. I've left these two ports uh, here on the bottom, these USB 3 ports on the front free, so that I can plug in my uh, USB stick as well as my USB hard drive, which I'll be using throughout these tests. So one of the comments I got uh, from the previous video was that you guys really couldn't see the screen. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually as I boot up this OpenSUSE, I'm going to boot it into a rescue mode first and get an SSH server running so that what I can do is on the MacBook, I can actually SSH into uh, the, the VCS machine and uh, actually do screen capture so that I can put that into the video. So uh, hopefully that will help enhance this video a little bit more and uh, make this easier for you all to see exactly what I'm doing. So um, I'll begin by uh, inserting the uh, USB stick for OpenSUSE and uh, using the keyboard, I'll go ahead and navigate uh, to, to the PC mode. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch PC mode. Uh, it's gonna uh, begin by letting me know that I can boot into a new operating system. Uh, I've already got the USB drive plugged in. I'll hit restart. It's going to confirm. I'm going to say yes. Uh, and now it's going to begin booting just like a, a PC would. Now I do know that this uses a UEFI style firmware rather than a traditional PC BIOS. So that's important. And I think you'll also find out, uh, here's the OpenSUSE screen, that there may be operating systems that may not support UEFI. And so I actually have one here that I want to test later. This is React OS. Uh, I don't know if it supports UEFI. Uh, but we're certainly gonna gonna find out. I also know it also supports a uh, secure boot, so that's something we may need to also be aware of. Um, so we'll be exploring that a little bit further. So let's begin here uh, with OpenSUSE and going into Rescue System. So I'm gonna launch Rescue System. So this will just take a few minutes for itself to boot. Uh, and you can see that it said UEFI secure boot enabled. You, you probably couldn't see that, but it did say that. Um, and we'll let it boot up into the, the prompt. And once we're loaded, um, I'll get an SSH server running, and then we will uh, switch over to that view. All right, so I've got the rescue environment configured. So over here on the Atari VCS, I actually have an SSH server running. And what I've also done is added a password to the root user. By default, the rescue mode does not have a root password. So setting one will allow you to SSH in from the other machine. Uh, so here we can actually uh, take a look at the screen capture. And uh, what I will show you, if you, if you look, uh, I will log in to the system uh, as root. So this is the, the IP address that was given to the Atari VCS. Enter my password and I'm now logged in. So taking a quick look at the system, 
uh, Linux Rescue, and this is an x86 system. So let's begin by taking a look at the processors, the CPUs. And let's cat that out and take a look. So these are, um, as we know, these are embedded AMD chips. So these are AMD Ryzen's uh, with a Radeon Vega graphics card. So this is an APU or an accelerated processing unit as, as AMD likes to call them. Um, looks like these are running about 1.3 gigahertz. I'm assuming these use some sort of um, stepping depending on you know what they're doing. Uh, right now the machine is pretty idle so it's not running at a high speed um, and you can see here this one's running almost at 1.4 gigahertz uh, and there are about uh, four CPUs uh, installed on this particular machine so it has four cores. Uh, taking a look at the RAM um, so you know this again is supposed to be a, an 8 gigabyte machine uh, looks here like Linux uh, is showing that there's um, you know, a total of almost six gigs. Uh, we can actually do a human readable view on that, just under six gigs. So again, this is supposed to be an eight gigabyte machine. So either one of two things is going on, either the, the video uh, is using some of the RAM um, for itself, which is more than likely, or there's something else happening with, with, this, with the memory on this system uh, being used in some other way. But I'm, I'm gonna pretty much go with, I believe it's gonna be shared VRAM for the video. Um, so that's, so that's the, the memory and the CPU. Let's take a look at the hard drive layout because this is where I think things get a little interesting. Um, so just doing a quick F disk, you know, um, you know, these loopbacks don't really mean much uh, here, but what's interesting is the, this is, this is the disks we, the disk we care about. Um, you can ignore dev SDA because that's my flash disk for the, for the rescue environment. But here, this MMC Block Zero device, you can see this is a 30 gig, you know, 29.2 gig drive. Uh, this is the built-in uh, storage that comes with the machine. You can see almost, uh, in fact, exactly uh, nine partitions here. Um, so what I'd like to do is start looking a little bit deeper at these. Um, these EFI system partitions, you know, uh, typically this is where um, you know the firmware and other things live. And what you can notice, and, and I'm, I'm gonna, pretty much guess on this, but I'm gonna be pretty sure I'm correct, is when you look at these and you notice that these are the exact same size, I'd be willing to bet that these are mirrors of each other. So in other words, you know, this is a copy. So if you lose one, you have a backup. Um, the same is true for, for these, uh, you know, Linux root file systems. Uh, we can confirm that either it's a backup or maybe it's a, it's a fail, a fallback, you know, perhaps if you're doing a, you know, good practice in some of these embedded machines is you have a copy of the other partition so that as an example if, if one of the if you're doing an update a firmware update as an example and um, it fails it can fall back to the previous version by simply switching the partition so it's highly possible that they've included a feature like that into the VCS which is great if that's true um, because that gives you an opportunity to have a fail safe but what it also means is that if you plan to install an alternative operating system such as Linux or Windows you need to be careful not to erase all of these. You want to be very careful which ones you end up modifying. Um, so we'll have to explore that a little bit further and figure out um, how we properly manipulate these. But I think one of the first things I want to do uh, with this system uh, is actually take a full disk image of the hard drive using this rescue image. So what I'll do is I'll actually start um, an image copy or a DD, uh, data dump, whatever you want to call it, uh, onto this actual USB uh, stick. So I'll actually dump the entire uh, hard drive image. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get that started. And uh, once the image is complete, uh, we, will, uh, we will look a little bit deeper into the system and see what's actually on these file systems. So what I've done here is in preparation for taking the disk image and also to explore the file systems, I've created a set of directories in the slash MNT. So I've got VCS one through nine, uh, which I created, which correspond of course to these file systems. Now, not all of these may be mountable. Um, we'll find out if we can mount them or not. Um, but at minimum, um, I also know that there's some data on this particular uh, A data disk, nothing that I particularly care about but I wanna be able to access it so I can store the disk, the disk dump on here. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, begin by mounting that drive. So that is dev SDB, since it's the second uh, disk I've put in with only a single partition. 
I'm gonna go ahead and put it here. Okay, great. So this is this is the drive. So uh, what I'm gonna do next is uh, I'm gonna create a new directory and call this VCS. And what I'm gonna do is again, let's take a quick F disk of this. So there's two ways we can go about this. We can either take the entire disk as a block and assume that, you know what, this is a 30 gig disk. It's always gonna be a 30 gig disk because it's what's built in to the VCS. Now, and we know we can expand it, but we also know that the built in is a 30 gig drive. So we can take the entire disk image or we can take each one separately, but I think it'll be a lot easier to just take the entire disk at once. So let's go ahead and just do that. So I'm going to copy that. So we're gonna say, okay, dd, the in file equals slash dev mmc block zero. The out file equals mount my a data drive, my VCS directory, and we're gonna call this disk image. And we're gonna give it a date. We're just gonna call it image file. Um, we don't necessarily care about the block size. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and let it roll. Um, you probably could specify it as 512, since that is technically the sector size. Um, so we can do that just to be safe. Um, let's see, is there anything else we need for that? I think that's probably good. So I'm gonna go ahead and start, kick that off. So we're gonna fire that off and uh, that's gonna take some time to complete. So let's let that uh, run and uh, we'll come right back. All right, so the uh, disk imaging has completed. Uh, so we can see here that it's, it's done. Let's uh, double check that, make sure it's, it's actually there. I'm certain that it is. And here's my disk image, so stored. So we have that just in case something goes wrong, we've got that. I also know that there's the ability to get the actual disk image or an ISO image, I believe. Um, someone out there sent, shared a Google uh, Drive share link that has that. So I know that worst case scenario, I can go pick that image up and reflash my VCS. But let's begin by looking at um, the uh, mount points here and I want to go ahead and start by attaching the disks uh, or the partitions and see if we can access these. So let's take a look and let's begin with the first ones. So here's our list. So we can just in order see if we can mount these. Um, so let's start with partition one, attach it to the VCS one. So that actually did work. So let's just proceed with all of them and see if we can mount them all. And then we can see what's on these. And I know for certain that Linux home is gonna be the, uh, where all the apps are stored. So that's gonna be the main home directory. Um, okay, so we've got them mounted. So let's do a quick check and just do a list uh, and see exactly what we've got. So the first uh, three that were marked as EFI are VFAT, which is a fat type, fat type file system. Um, so we'll take a look at those. Um, however, the rest are ext4, which is the Linux extended for file system. Okay, so yeah, so VCS4, so this is gonna be slash var, slash var, this, this is the var directory, and I know that because you can see here, this is a standard var, so you got var lib, var cache, var log, var spool, that's a traditional Linux var file system. Um, so just looking here, these are gonna be settings that are kind of uh, you know, as an example, Bluetooth, chances are this is where the settings are for my joystick. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that if I look a little bit deeper um, in, into this file, I'd be willing to bet you that this is probably the settings for, um, for, for these two controllers, since I've only connected two controllers. Um, and this isn't terribly interesting. This is just... <laughs> Me, me being nerdy and just really looking in. But yeah, here you go. So lo and behold, classic controller. So that is exactly this one. So you can see here the Bluetooth information is stored. 
So that's the var file system. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, I believe five and six did not work. So let's look at seven, see what's inside that. So I believe seven and eight are copies of each other. And, and, and again, just to, just to sort of illustrate that, and what, I'm, what I mean uh, is if you look, you note that these are essentially, they both have the same type, which is Linux root, and the same exact size, um, and the same number of sectors. So what that tells me is these are, these are clones. Now whether they're, uh, however they're cloned, I don't know. Are they exact clones? I don't know. Are there differences between the two? It's possible. As, as I said before, a lot of times when you do system updates, a lot of vendors when, in an embedded system will have one partition be the old one and one be the new one, so you have a fallback. So it's possible there are some differences between these two. Uh, we could take a deep dive and look. In fact, let's, let's experiment just a little bit. So let's go into um, the VCS7 directory. Let's see if there's anything in the ETC or Etsy directory. Uh, that might give it away. Um, you know, in fact, we could look at timestamps. Perhaps there's timestamps. So this was all, uh, you know, these were all August 12th as an example. You can see the, the primary date here, August 12th. Uh, let's go back and look at um, VCS 8 and see if there's anything different there, if the date stamps are, are any different there. Um, so yeah, so as a matter of fact, this is a different set of dates. So these were December 4th. So indeed, that is correct. So uh, what we can determine is that the uh, one of the file systems, the first one, is the original version which shipped with the system. And the update that Atari launched, uh, obviously before they shipped the units out, uh, they produced an update on December uh, 4th, uh, perhaps even December 19th, because actually that says 2018. So no, definitely December 4th. Um, is the timestamp that this was last built or modified, in, at least in the Etsy directory. Um, so that is confirmed. So there is indeed two, uh, a replica, if you will, one old, one new as a fallback for the VCS. So we have confirmed that. I've also determined that this system uses uh, apt. It's a Debian-based system. Uh, and the way I was able to determine that is if you go into the VCS8 directory and you cat the password file, you can see an apt user in this system. So if you look, you'll notice underscore apt. Um, so that tells me that the system itself uses apt. Now, one thing which is interesting, which you can do, we can cheroot into this environment. Uh, slash bin slash ash. Here we go, we're now in BusyBox inside of that system. And now what we can do is we can actually go into var. Let's see if there's an actual uh, apt command. There is an apt command. So we can see at least the system uses apt. So chances are it is a Debian based system. Um, and we know that for certain. So uh, in fact, let's do, an, let's do a dpackage and let's list out the files that are uh, on this machine or the packages. Oh. Failed to open package info file. Interesting. Oh, you know why? Bar is not mounted. Okay, so what we want to do is basically take a look at the package list for this system. But because Debian stores its package files on var, and var was not mounted inside of the cherooted environment, what we're going to do is bind mount the VCS4 directory as var into that environment so that we have access to those files. So we'll do this, we'll do a bind mount where we'll bind mount, um, mount VCS4, and we're going to put it into mount slash var. And now we will cheroot into mount VCS8 slash bin slash ash since there's no bash interpreter and we should now be able to same problem fail to open package info file hmm huh so i guess it doesn't include a package manager so that's another thing we know is that it doesn't include a package manager so the question is how do the how does the system update well i think it updates via flashing right so in other words it downloads an image and it's going to flash that other partition. So it's going to have a partition image and it's going to overlay the, those files on there. That also means that all of your games 
and all of your applications are going to be stored in that home directory. So let's take a look there. Let's actually exit uh, this and we can actually remove that bind mount as well. And what we can do now is go into VCS9 and let's take a look there. Quite a few files in there. Um, there's a version of Mono which tells me that some of the games use .NET, so that allows this system to run .NET uh, applications. So a lot of games are written in C Sharp. Uh, I think actually games for Unity are actually also in C Sharp and can use the Mono runtime. Let's see what these are. So this is the Unsung Warriors game that I downloaded. Let's see what this one is. VCS Companion app, which I did not set up. And this is uh, Google Chrome. And let's see, this should be Missile Command. So interestingly enough, um, this is just the Missile Command game. Why don't we dive into that just a little bit and have a look at it. So let's take a look at this bundle file. Missile Command recharged um, with its ID. And notice it says Unity Player. So this is another Unity game. And if you dive into here, you're just going to find Unity asset files and just Unity stuff. Okay. Interesting, so um, they're calling this Apertus. Um, I guess that's the name of their distribution, Apertus V2020. Um, so I guess that's their, uh, their code name for the Atari Linux operating system. Um, so that's, that's interesting. So that is kind of the deep dive into the Atari VCS file system. So we've learned a little bit more today about the Atari VCS system. All right, well, that's it for this episode. So while we didn't get a chance to actually complete the installation of the Linux operating system, we learned a lot. And now I feel better prepared to go out and make an informed decision on the best way to install a Linux or alternative operating system on top of the VCS. So we know that if we just erase the entire disk, we would have to come back and potentially re-image this thing in order to recover the VCS operating system if we even want it. Uh, but if you're planning to do an installation of another operating system and you don't care about the VCS operating system, you can proceed and just wipe out the entire disk. Another option would be to actually add a second hard drive inside of this unit. And also in a future episode, I'll be cracking the case of this uh, Atari unit and seeing actually what, what's inside uh, and how we can update it. Um, so that's it for this episode of Retro Access. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And if you have any other comments or questions, we'd love to have uh, your input. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time on Retro Access.